Hello everybody, hope you are well. Welcome back to Understanding Cancer Season 2. Um, today we're going to be looking at Lecture 7. And Lecture 7 focuses on um, the normal and dysregulated EGFR signaling pathway. So let's have a recap of what you should have understood from um, last week's lecture. So last week we discussed GBCR, normal and dysregulated signaling pathway. So GBCR uh, are helical transmembrane receptor proteins that are found on the cell surface. It has three domains made of loops. So you have the extracellular, transmembrane and the intracellular. Now the activated receptor of GPCR activates the G protein. Okay? And this is what exchanges GDP for GTP. Now GDP is a type of nucleotide um, that consists of a guanosin, uh, the uh, ribose sugar, and two phosphates. That's what is called a diphosphate. And um, it's been uh, exchanged for GTP, which is guanosin 5 triphosphate. So it has an addition of a phosphate group. Yep. So G proteins are classified according to the alpha subunits. And the alpha subunits can be divided into different subtypes. So you've got the G alpha I. G alpha S, G alpha trap 13, and G alpha Q slash 11. Adenocyclase stimulates the production of the intercellular secondary messenger called C AMP. So C AMP or CAMP uh, is an abbreviation for cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And this has been produced from adenosine triphosphate. Now, CAMP stimulates the protein kinase A, um, and the protein kinase A is made up of four subunits. So it consists of two catalytic subunits and two regulatory subunits. The CAMP binds to the regulatory subunits of the PKA. CAMP response element binding protein, CREP, is a transcription factor and one of the PKA targets that regulate the transcription of target genes and this is what helps initiate cellular response and activity for example proliferation, motility, angiogenesis, um, apoptosis, differentiation and a variety of means. This regulated GPCR signaling is caused by point mutations and point mutations have a variety of different ranges from silence, from missense, and so on. So the CAMP PKA CREP signaling has the tumor suppressive, i.e., to stop the tumor being formed, and also tumor promoting roles to uh, promote the progression of the actual tumor. So increases in PKA and CAMP levels increases proliferation, differentiation, cell migration and invasion and apoptosis in tumour uh, 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 related cancer cells. So what will we learn today? What is epidermal growth factor receptor? The structure of the epidermal growth factor receptor, the normal EGFR signaling pathway, so um, if we involve three key steps, so we're going to begin with receptor activation, followed by signal transduction, and then cellular response. We will then discuss how to turn off the EGFR signaling pathway and the link between GPCR and EGFR, okay, because it's inter- uh, uh, cross-talk or interrelation uh, between them. And there's also causes of dysregulated EGFR signaling pathway in cancer. So just a reminder that an ideal way of learning is to divide the time across the seven days. Okay? 
and um, the total time hopefully should take one hour. Um, you can do it at your own pace, so um, and then you can challenge yourself with a quiz. So, gentle reminder to that in order to uh, support your learning, uh, we have um, done some uh, key facts or diagrams by HN Designs in a simplified way. Um, there's also a glossary to help understand what keywords mean. There's also revision posters, quizzes to test your knowledge, and a reference list for further reading. A special thanks to my family, my friends, my colleagues, and also uh, the respected teachers and um, health professions who uh, installed the Passion of Cancer. So let's begin with what is the epidermal growth factor receptor. So EGFR uh, is a type of protein, okay? So it's a receptor protein that consists of 1,186 amino acids. What type of protein is it? It's a transmembrane glycoprotein. So a glycoprotein is a protein that has underwent um, uh, what would say a post-translational modification. What that means is once it produces a protein, it goes further changes or modifications. So one example of this is the addition of a glucose, uh, which is a type of sugar to the protein. And this is known as glycosylation. So when we refer to glyco glycoprotein, what that means is it's a protein that has a sugar attached to it to make it a glycoprotein. And it's situated within a transmembrane. So the transmembrane is like embedded within the cell membrane that controls what enters and leaves the cell. So in normal cells, the EGFR expression is between 40,000 to 100,000 receptors per cell. And it is also a member of the uh, receptor tyrosine kinase family. Um, so um, the receptor tyrosine kinase family has four uh, members or, or types. So you have EGFR, which is also known as ERB, B1, also HER1. Her this is the predominant type that is found within humans. There's the ERB, B2, HER2, NEU. Then the food is the ERB, B3, uh, her, otherwise known as HER3. And there's ERB, B4, otherwise known as HER4. So um, this is a, a, a brief uh, or simplified diagram. Um, so what you can see is the ligand, you can see the receptor, um, and uh, you can see also the plasma membrane. So it's like Im embedded within the plasma membrane and it's divided into three types, which we'll discuss later. So the structure of the epidermal growth factor receptor it has a molecular weight between 170 to 185 kilo Dalton. So the Daltons is the units in how you measure the weight of, uh, for example, um, uh, proteins, glucose and, and other molecules. And it has three domains, extracellular domain, transmembrane domain and intracellular domain. So here you can see an insight into the different domains. So it's divided into three main parts and further divided. So extracellular domain, then you have the uh, transmembrane domain, then you have the intracellular domain. So the extracellular domain, you have the um, uh, uh, domain one, domain two, domain three, domain four. And then in the middle there, you've got the transmembrane domain and the JMA, JMB, 
Then you have a tyrosine kinase domain and a C-terminal, which is part of the intracellular. So the extracellular domain, it is an N-terminal ligand binding domain. So let us have a recap of what we mean by an N-terminal. So what that means is, is because e EGFI is a receptor protein, so proteins are made of amino acids. An amino acid, it contains an amine group, okay, which is the N side. Um, so the, uh, and it also has the C side, which is the C terminal, because they, it has a carboxylic acid group, C double O H. Now, when we refer to the N terminal ligand binding domain, because it's a protein, it has lots of amino acids stuck together. So the N terminal means that it's the 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 the, the side where the that has the amine group. Okay, so it is an N terminal ligand binding domain. It is a conserved region with lots of cysteine residues. So cysteine is a type of amino acid. It contains, in fact, six hundred and twenty-one amino acids, and Exons 18 to 28 is where that's found. So exon, these are the type of uh, regions that that codes things. Um, that uh, it, it has a sequence as such. It, it, it codes a particular amino acid, and it has a, a dimerization um, arm and it is uh, divided into four domains. So we'll discuss what a dimerization arm in a bit. So the extracellular domain. So domain uh, one, it contains lots of uh, leucine, which is a type of amino acid uh, uh, fragments. So it has one between one to 133 amino acids. And the function of that is to bind to the ligand. Now, domain two of the extracellular domain, it contains a dimerization arm. And it has lots of the amino acids called cysteine. And uh, approximately, it's 134 to 312 amino acids uh, with exons 5 to 7 is found over there. And the purpose of the uh, domain two of the extracellular domain is that it interacts with another dimerization arm of um, another receptor to form a homodimer. So, in other words, in order to be functional and active, it needs to have two receptors joined together, and they join via the uh, domain uh, two. Yeah, because that's where, where the Dimerization arm consists of, and this is what helps maintain the EGFR uh, signaling. The heterodimers. This means that um, it forms a dimer with another member of the uh, EGFR family. Uh, uh, so it could be her two, her three, her four. And um, it has a similar domain, um, so that's what allows the bond together. Um, and it doesn't really make any contact with the ligand. Its main function is to form a dimer. Now, domain three, it contains lots of the leucine amino acids. Uh, it has approximately 313 to 440 uh, five amino acids with exons 8 to 12, and a function of that is to bind to the ligand. Uh, the domain 4 um, is a cysteine uh, rich region, meaning that it contains lots of cysteine amino acid residues. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it had 446 or 621 amino acids with exons 13 to 16. Uh, so it forms disulfide bonds uh, to domain two, 
what that means is it forms uh, via the element uh, uh, called sulfur uh, it forms uh, two sulfur um, atoms um, necessary for a bridge or a bond with uh, domain two and this is what links to the transmembrane domain it also um, does not really make any form of contact with the ligand um, so uh, previously we have mentioned exons and introns um, in the previous episode and also here so I thought a visual image um, would help um, to um, explain this so to, in order to produce a protein it requires a two-step process um, transcription and translation the transcription is a step needed to produce the templates with the sequence need, uh, uh, of the actual um, target protein so in order for to do that the DNA needs to unwind so it's like a twisted ladder of two uh, strands of polynucleotide with lots of nucleotides so the twisted ladder is unwinded to form two separated strands now the separated strand what happens is a template is being formed and this template is called the mRNA and then the mRNA is not called the DNA anymore it's called the mRNA because it's a messenger RNA because the RNA has a single uh, strand and um, also has the information that is being transferred to the ribosomes where proteins are being made but before it actually leaves the nucleus to do that it needs to be matured so the the, the, the pre-mRNA is made up of the exon and intron um, coding regions to for the target protein and the exons are the coding regions and the introns are the non-coding regions so the spliced mRNA is where a via an enzyme the introns are being removed and the exons remain and we call that a splice, splice mRNA or a mature RNA which then leaves the nucleus and then it goes to the ribosome um, where the information is being translated to produce a target protein. The transmembrane domain is a hydrophobic domain. It doesn't like water and it has, consists of 23 amino acids, uh, which compromises of the exon 17, and it firmly attaches to the receptor part of the membrane and it is involved within the dimerization process. The intercellular domain, um, it's, it's, it's found within the cytoplasm part and it has the C terminal. Uh, so the cytoplasm is where all the chemical reactions take place and the C terminal means it the, the ending part consists of the the carboxylic acid group and it consists of 542 amino acids there's a few for, uh, for, uh, sites where phosphorylation takes place meaning that there is an addition of a phosphate group and um, there are lots of amino acids called tyrosine and that is involved within the phosphorylation process um, and there was also lots of lysine residues so that's another type of amino acids and that's involved in ubiquitination. We will discuss the difference between ubiquitination and phosphorylation soon. Now the intercellular domain is subdivided into three uh, types so you've got the flexible juxta um, uh, membrane segment which consists of uh, 40 amino acids um, so this is why you have the JM and the JB uh, part. Um, 
within the diagram and you also have the um, tyrosine kinase domain. Um, so this is the um, amino acids that compromises between 690 and 953 amino acids. And there is also the C-terminal tail, uh, which uh, consists of 954 to 1136 amino acids. Now, the tyrosine kinase domain is subdivided um, into three parts. Um, so it has an N lobe, which is made up of a beta sheet. Um, so this is like a um, more of like sheets um, uh, shape and there's um, the C lobe which has the alpha helical uh, shape so that's like a, a helical side so this is what because in order to produce a protein um, yes you require the amino acid sequence but it's a more complex like that than that because um, in the early stages of the production of the proteins, um, you have like a, a, a combination of the beta sheet and the alpha helical um, in early stages, so like the secondary structure. So, but in this case, what we refer to over here is the tyrosine kinase domain. Um, so it has an end lobe that has the shape of the beta sheets and the C lobe has more of the helical um, alpha um, shape. And the, you also have the ATP binding site that is uh, found between both of them. So what's the difference between ubiquitination and phosphorylation? So both of these images are from uh, Creative Commons. So ubiquitin is a small protein. And what it does, it helps direct the um, uh, proteins that need to be degraded because either they're um, old or damaged or um, uh, malfunctioned. So it's been targeted to an, a structure called proteasome. And a proteasome is what breaks down the proteins. Whereas phosphorylation, phosphorylation um, is where you add a phosphate group. So let's look at an example of uh, ATP, so adenosine triphosphate, which is involved in um, helping producing energy. Now, when you um, dephosphorylate ATP, to ADP, you're basically removing the phosphate, okay? And when you're adding a phosphate group, that's known as phosphorylation, so ADP with adding the phosphate forms um, uh, ATP. So how is the uh, EGFR gene expression uh, regulated? Well, there is an interaction between an enzyme called topoisomerase 1 and the transcription factor C gen. And the ligand epidermal growth factor can help regulate the RNA of the EGFR by expressing ETF, which stands for EGFR specific transcription factor. The promoter, which is a region where um, transcription takes place, can also be modulated by two types of proteins, uh, E1A, there's also uh, specificity uh, protein 1, SP1, and there is a type of protein called um, AP2, so activator protein. So let's have a insight on the type of proteins that we discussed there. So E1A 
they stimulate the gene transcription uh, for a virus called adenovirus. Also, cells that have been um, placed within the G0, so G0 is the uh, silence or the crescent phase um, as part of the cell cycle. Now, those that have been placed there, they are able to um, uh, enter the S phase where DNA production uh, takes place. And this is facilitated by E1A. SP1 is a variation for specificity protein 1. It's a type of transcription factor um, that is um, involved uh, with genes um, that has uh, lots of uh, cysteine guanine binding sites in their promoter region. Um, and so it more or less helps with uh, the following cellular responses, proliferation, so growth, differentiation, so specialising cells, um, apoptosis, cell death, and tumour formation. Activating protein 2 is a type of transcription factor, and that regulates gene expression during early development. The C gen, so C gen is also a transcription factor um, that binds with another transcription factor called CFOS and um, what that does it produces AP1 activator protein um, complex and this helps um, to bind to cyclin D1 promoter region and cyclin D1 is importance within the G1 phase of the cell cycle. Type of isoporase 1 is an enzyme, uh, so it's a type of protein, and what that does, it um, top, top 1 specifically um, produces single-stranded breaks. Because when you're unwinding the DNA, so when you have a twisted ladder made up of two strands, and then when you unwind it, it's going to cause some uh, super coiling um, uh, along the ray. And um, we need to unwind uh, it in order to make the replication so you can have that copy template for the target protein in question. So top one produces the single stranded breaks. And then its top two is the one that produces the double-stranded breaks. And there is a difference between a type of supercoiling there, because if it's a negative supercoiling, it helps separate the um, DNA. Whereas a positive supercoiling, it helps inhibit the separation of the DNA strands. So here's an image um, from uh, Johnson, uh, 2017. So uh, what you can see over here is in the first image, there's unwinding of the DNA of the parental. And then you can see that as it unwinds, there's the uh, twisting of the um, DNA. It's kind of like super coiling. But when you have top of eye summarise involved there, it's forming these single stranded breaks. So it helps the DNA strand to rotate. So let's look at the first step of the signaling pathway, which is receptor activation. So we need to understand what type of ligand, what's the first semester, um what are we dealing with here? So the epidermal growth factor is a, a protein that consists of 53 amino acids. You can normally find this within the heart, within the gut, so with the small intestines and the large intestines. You can find it within the brain, the teeth 
and also the reproductive tracts and the eyes. It has similar, uh, but approximately 35 to 40 percent in what it consists of. Uh, to another ligand called transforming growth factor alpha, okay, so that comprises of 50 amino acids. Now, to, in order to understand the receptor activation, uh, it consists of three uh, steps, so the binding of the ligand to the receptor, the dimerization of the receptor, and also the uh, phosphorylation of the C-terminal domain, so the intercellular domain. So let's look at the first step. So the ligand binds to the EGFR receptor. Okay. So we discussed the extracellular domains and how it's divided into the uh, four domains. Um, so the two and the four they are pushed away to help one and three okay, to interact with the ligand and be able to um, present its position. Now the ligand specifically binds to a particular receptor and it's very specific. So here you can see the structure one, two, and three, and four of the extracellular domain, which we discussed. And here you can see the ligand binding onto the extracellular domain region of the EGFR receptor. So EGFR, otherwise known as HER1 ERBB1 uh, receptor. Um, has a range of uh, specific ligands it associates. Um, the first one is growth factor of um, EGFR, which is um, the focus for today's uh, lecture. And this is involved in proliferation and differentiation. It is also uh, present in the heart, the guts, so the small intestine, large intestine, the brain, teeth, reproductive tracts and the eyes. Heparin binding EGF is involved in tissue repair and regeneration. For instance, if there is an injury uh, within the liver, heart and bladder as a result of, for example, surgery, um, it helps with growth, um, migration, adhesion and differentiation. The amphi regular AREG. So, this is a protein that is found within a membrane and it is involved with cells that are close in contact with one another. So, this uh, uh, is a type of uh, signaling which is known as juxtaquine signaling, otherwise known as contact dependent signaling. So this facilitates a range of cellular processes such as proliferation, motility and survival. And it is involved within the development of the mammary glands, bone tissue and egg cells known as oocytes and also the maturation stage. Epigon uh, is still unknown at the moment. Uh, however, research studies have suggested that it plays a role within the skin, the mammary gland, and the dyspaceous gland. Beta selenin, BTC, is a type of growth factor produced within the pancreas and small intestine. It helps with the mitosis, which is a type of cell division involved in growth and repair. In particular areas, such as the retina, which is found behind the eye, and also the smooth muscle cells within uh, blood vessels. The epiregulin, EPR, this is a new uh, member of the 
EGF ligand family that is involved with in tissue repair and wound healing, particularly in the oral cavity. So the oral cavity consists of the mouth, the teeth, the tongue um, and surrounding areas. And it helps in increase, um, you know, uh, these functions, particularly in the lining of uh, organ tissues. And also in the malignant stage, for instance, colorectal, lung and bladder cancer. Transforming growth factor alpha is involved in cell migration, tissue repair, homeostasis, growth and differentiation. It is particularly found within the guts, the liver, kidneys, the breasts, the skeletal muscle that's involved in support and movement, the skin and reproductive organs. PRB2, otherwise known as HER2 and NEU, it binds to no ligands and is more involved within dimerization of the receptor. ERB, B3, HER3, it can bind to neuroglins and heroglins. So neuroglins family are involved in the development and function of other organs, for example, nerves, the breast and the heart, uh, compromises of uh, NRG1, NRG2, NRG3, NRG4, NRG5, NRG6. NRG4 particularly is a brown fat enriched uh, hormone that helps in the balance of the energy and also in the metabolism of sugar and fat. Herogalin, HRG1 and HRG2, um, they are more involved in the cell proliferation, differentiation, invasion and survival in normal and malignant tissues. It's a type of growth factor. ERB4 and HER4 that's also involved in neuroglins, BTC, HB, EGF, and EPR, which we discussed earlier. Let us now look at step two, dimerization of the receptor. So the dimerization arm in the extracellular domain two interacts with the dimerization arm of another receptor. And this is what helps to form the homodimer. So in other words, if you have EGFR1, another EGFR1, and the dimerization arm of both of them joined together, that's known as a homodimer. Now when you have heterodimerization between family members, for example, EGF ligands can help induce the uh, heterodimerization of EGFR with HER2, HER3, HER4. But the neuroclin 4 stimulates heterodimerization of HER4 with HER1, 2, and 3. If you look at the previous image, you can see that the, the, there is a, the sites are interlinking together. Let us now look at the cyclical transduction. In this cyclical transduction pathway, um, you have a, a variety of signal pathway in which um, EGFR has um, a role. So you have the phosphodiol isotol free kinase, uh, PI3K, AKT, mTOR. There's JAKSTAT, there's a RAS, RAF. MAPK, ERK, and there's also the phospholipase C gamma protein, protein kinase C. However, today we will focus on the RAS, RAF, MAPK, ERK. This requires the recruitment of six uh, effector proteins. There's the Growth factor receptor bound protein 2 adapter protein, GRB2. 
There's the SOS, Sun on Seven Less, RAS, RAF, MEK, and MAPK. MAPK and is that is a abbreviation for Mitigan Associated Protein Kinase. So it's involved um, a lot in mitosis um, um, and because of its presence there, it's a facilitation. This is how the name has been arrived. So after the receptor activation, the GRP2 adapter protein um, binds uh, to the um, phosphorylation site on the cytoplasmic domain of EGFR. And there is a, a location within the GRB2 adapter protein called SH2, which stands for SRC homology 2 domain. And this is how it attaches onto the uh, cytoplasmic domain of the EGFR. Now, the pH uh, domains, uh, which stand for plextrin homology domain of the um, SOS interacts with the GRB. So this is how it gets attached with it. And um, SOS uh, is a preparation for son of 7 and it's a uh, quinine nucleotide exchange factor. And this is what gets recruited to the plasma membrane. So what does the GEF do? Well, um, it binds to a small um, guanosine triphosphatase um, enzyme protein called RAS. And RAS is a type of oncogene. And there are other subtypes called HRAS, KRAS, and NRAS. And RAS is bound to GDP, which is um, a preparation for um, guanosine diphosphate. SOS as a GEF catalyzes the conversion of GDP to GTP. Okay. So this is what causes a change within the RAS and turns RAS activity on. Um, so here with an image, you can see that originally RAS is bound with guanosine diphosphate, but with the help of SRS, it transfers into triphosphate. The GRB adapter protein via its um, SH3 domain is able to recruit the SRS. And this is what helps initiate the protein kinase cascade. So the activated RAS is what activates the RAF1. Now RAF1 is also known as CRAF and it's a type of protein kinase enzyme that's enriched with two amino acids, serine and theonine, uh, amino acid residues. And it has two domains, N-terminus regulatory domain and the C-terminus kinase domain. So how is this achieved? So how does RAS bind with RAF? There is a region within RAS protein called RAF binding domain, RBD. And this is what translocates RAF to the plasma membrane. The cysteine rich domain, CRD, which is another region of RAS, it consists of 139 amino acids, and this is what activates RAF1. So there's, what gets phosphorylated in RAF1 is the serine 338 position and tyrosine 341 position. And there is a 20 amino acid upstream 
of the ATP panic domain in the regulatory region. The phosphorylation of position serine 259 and serine 621 of FAF1 is inhibitory effect, and that is what is catalyzed by AKT. So essentially, what I'm trying to explain over here is that RAS has two regions that facilitates RAF1 activation, one that translocates, one that activates. And there are specific positions within RAF1 that is phosphorylated. And there is, this, there is an ATP binding domain in the regulatory region. So in order for phosphorylation to take space, it requires the ATP. And there is some regions um, within RAF1 that facilitates inhibitory. Now, if we recall a few episodes back, we discussed that phosphorylation can have a uh, promoting effect or it can have an inhibitory effect. Now, the position serine 338 within RAF1 can also be phosphorylated by a protein family called P21 activated kinase. Now, this is an interesting fact because the PAK1, it phosphorylates RAF1 in a growth factor independent manner. Okay, so it doesn't require a growth factor as such. Whereas PAK3, this is what phosphorylates two GTP binding proteins, CDC42 and RAK. And this is what is found within the plasma membrane. Now, the activated RAF1 is what binds to the MEK. Now, MEK stands for Mitigan Activated Protein Kinase, Kinase, MAPKK. And this is via serine 338 and tyrosine 341 on RAF1. And RAF1 directly phosphorylates MEK at position serine residues 217 and 221. And MEK is a rare tyrosine um, and threonine serine drought specificity kinase. So when you have deactivated MEK12, that phosphorylates ERK12 serine threonine kinase. And this is through an activation loop present within ERK and that contains a, a threonine um, glutamine tyrosine motif. So every time when you see, for example, serine threonine, um, glutamine, uh, tyrosine, um, all of these examples, these are type of amino acids. Let us now progress on to cellular response. So ERK12 serine threonine kinase is able to phosphorylate MAPK, which is Michigan associated protein kinase. And this is translocated to the nucleus where it phosphorylates to the transcription factor C mice, JUN, and C FOS. Okay. Now, as you can see, essentially what we have over here is a protein kinase cascade. So you have one protein kinase phosphorylates another protein kinase, and so on. So the, the, the C uh, mice um, and C JUN and the C FOS, these are examples of transcription factors. Now, from these, JUN and FOS families are able to produce a protein dimer. So essentially, JUN can bind with FOS, JUN B can join with FOS B, and JUN D can able to bind with FRA and FRA2. So here is simply an equation. So the C-FOS plus the C-JUN transcription factors 
they form a dimer and this dimer is called AP1 complex. Now the AP1 complex plus the C mice, that's what um, facilitates the transcription of target genes. For example, cyclin D1. And cyclin D1 transcription leads on to the production of the cyclin D1 protein. And the cyclin D1 protein is involved within the cell cycle, particularly in a G1S phase. So this is where you have the production of the organelles and then the S phase is where you have the DNA synthesis taking place. So there is a range of cellular activity as a result of target gene transcription. For proteins that are involved in cell migration, cell adhesion, cell proliferation, cell survival, angiogenesis, to production of ribosomes, translation of proteins, and also cell division itself. Now, MAP MAPK can also phosphorylate other targets. So, so far we've mentioned C John, C Miss, and um, oh my, sorry, and then C um, uh, Phos. Other targets include our anti apoptotic genes. You also have the um, FN receptor 2. So, the FN receptor 2 that is involved in uh, key cellular processes such as angiogenesis and um, growth of endothelial cells. So, um, the endothelium, we can find that, for example, with blood vessels. Also, um, you have the cell survival and migration. Uh, transformation specific ETS, uh, so the E stands for E26 family of proteins. So, they more or less regulates the normal cell cycle, particularly in a G1S transition, but the process is unclear. More particularly, in a malignant state, it can help growth and progression in colorectal cancer. Now, ERK12 has other targets, so we've discussed so far MAPK. So other targets include RSK1, TCF, ELK and apoptotic proteins. Let us begin with RSK1. RSK1 is an abbreviation for P90 ribosomal SC kinase 1. So it's phosphorylated at position T573 located in the C terminal kinase domain. And its role is that once it translocates to the nucleus, it activates immediate early genes. And those immediate early genes are CFOS and SRF. Now the CFOS can be phosphorylated at position S374 by ERK12, and it can also be phosphorylated by RSK at position S362. Now, the phosphorylation in the position of S221 and S36 and S380 is vital in the RSK1 activity. So what we're talking about here is position of these amino acids. OK. Now, the, let's progress on to ternary complex factor. Now, ERK is able to translocate to the nucleus and activate TCF. And that is what induces the CFOS and the C mice transcription factor. ELK is a perforation for ETS like one protein that also can be activated by ERK as it translocates within the nucleus. And this is at position S383, S389, S422. And this also occurs within the C-terminal transactivation domain. And as earlier discussed, CFOS and C-JUN is what makes the AP1 complex necessary for the transcription of cyclin um, uh, D1. 
when it binds with sea mice. Apoptotic proteins, so ERK can phosphorylate proteins that promote apoptosis, such as BIP, and this is what leads on to ubiquitination and proteasome degradation. So let's have a recall on the previous slides where we mentioned that ubiquitin is a small protein and that more or less directs the proteins that are either damaged or malfunctioned in order to be degraded by the proteasome. So essentially as such, it can negatively regulate apoptosis. And something that's really interesting is that activated EGF4 can directly translocate into the nucleus. And it can bind to transcription factor ETF1 and STAT3. And this is via proteins called importins. And as a result of this, the activation of these type of transcription factor is what upregulates the production of the, um, uh, the target gene cyclin D1 involved in the cell cycle. So how does the EGFR signaling pathway turn off? Y32 in position RAS um, can be phosphorylated by uh, SRC. And this is what holds the binding between RAS to RAF1. Okay. So it stops the activation of RAF1. Now RAS is still activated. The reason being is it has the GTP. Now the GTP needs to be hydrolyzed by the GTPase to produce GDP plus P in order to turn off the activity of RAS. And this is facilitated by a, a quick process called GTPase activated proteins. So these proteins, for example, neurofibromin 1, facilitates and it tries to make the speed faster to turn off the RAS activity. Now, in order to stop the interaction between the ligand and the receptor, you have um, subtype 2 and 4 of the extracellular domain of the receptor stop the 1 and the 3 to interact with the ligand. And what happens is, is that the EGF and EGFR complex, in other words, the, the um, ligand receptor complex, can enter pits called clathrin-coated pits from the plasma membrane. And the clathrin-coated pit, CCP, is then released into structures called entosomes via vesicles. Now, entosomes, this is what more or less facilitates the, um, um, the, the, the direction of the proteins because the EGFR can interact with CCP AP2 in the endosomes and the EGFR can be degraded by lysosome in the vesicles. However, another solution is that it can be recycled back onto the cell surface. And this is a similar case of AP2 where it can dissociate from the receptor ligand complex and can also be recycled back. So let's look at the link between the two signaling pathway, which we looked at so far, GPCR and EGFR. Now, protein kinase A is a key enzyme that's involved within GPCR. And it can phosphorylate some of the members of the RAS family, such as RAP1. And RAP1 can then phosphorylate BRAP, RAF, MEK, ERK, signaling pathway. The EPAC is one of the targets of the secondary messenger called C-CAMP, so the cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And EPAC is a 
guanosin exchange factor. So what happens is it can stimulate RAP1 and RAP2, which are members of the RAS family, to release GDP and bind to GDP. Protein kinase C is another type of protein kinases. And the activated EGFR and also the HER2 heterodimer can stimulate PKC, and that is what leads to the downstream signaling pathway. CREP, which stands for CAMP response element. The AP1 complex that is made up of JUN and FOS can bind to CREP. And uh, this occurs within the promoter region of their target genes. <laughs> so now let's look at the causes of the dysregulated EGFR signaling pathway. So here's another type of uh, presentation. Um, so we've mutated EGF over expression or gene amplification of the ligands and mutations within the ligand protein are some of the causes that lead on to cancer formation and cancer progression. The mutated RAS protein um, has a range of causes and can be found in a number of types of different cancers. For example, 30% of all human tumours carry the RAS genes. And RAS is an oncogene that keeps the uh, continuous growth of the tumour cells. And there is a mutation within the amino acid sequence. And this is what causes the production of the abnormal form of RAS protein. And this also affects how it works. For example, there is an increased GTP because the abnormal form of RAS can decrease GTPase activity and increase the rate of exchange from GDP to GTP. And hyperactivity of RAS can also dysregulate the cell cycle and cause uncontrolled replication. Now, some of the 30% of all human tumours that carry these RAS genes, examples include prostate cancer, where 90% of prostate cancer patients have a mutation within KRAS in codon 12. There's also a high rate within skin cancer, such as melanoma, where you have the NRAS form of mutations. And tumours within the salivary glands so this is what produces the, 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 the liquid solution that is found within a mouth called saliva, and it contains enzymes that help to break down the food. And there is the high rate of HRAS mutations that is found within the salivary glands where this secretion is being produced. Mutated RAF protein can be found in a number of different cancers, especially the BRAF form, for example, non-small cell lung cancer, colorectal cancer, melanomas, and also thyroid cancer. Mutated ERK protein um, has also been found, so um, it helps stabilize and induce the expression of uh, uh, FOXC1 transcription factor and this is what is found in triple negative breast cancer, which accounts of around 15% of um, um, cases. And uh, amongst the causes are um, uh, premenopausal, so um, uh, patients, and also uh, it can occur um, where there's no expression of HER2 receptor or the ER receptor, um, but there is um, uh, a highly expressed EGFR and also BRCA 
um, gene, BR, BRCA genes. Now, the mutated MAPK protein, so when you have um, a missense mutation within the base, um, what that means is, for example, um, when you have a missense mutation, it can affect the structure as well as the function. So if you have, um, instead of, um, of uh, there is, a, for example, there's a substitution of valine for glutamic acid, and that is in position 600. Okay. Now, because of that substitution of glutamic acid instead of the um, uh, uh, valine, this is what can lead on to cancer progression, particularly in melanoma and thyroid cancer. And this is what leads to hyperactivity and carcinogenesis, which is the tumor formation. So as a result, when you have these phenotype of mutations that, or an increased gene copy number, that is what facilitates cell cycle progression, protein synthesis, invasion, apoptosis, angiogenesis, differentiation, motility, and chemotherapy resistance in many types of cancers. So we have now come to the end of this lecture. And hopefully what you should understand is the EGF ligand binds with the EGFR receptor. This is what leads to the dimerization of the receptor and also the autophosphorylation of the cytoplasmic domains. There are seven uh, effector proteins. Um, so you have GRB2, SOS, RAS, RAF1, MEK, ERK12 and MAPK. Because once the RAF1 is being uh, uh, activated, you can have a range of protein kinases being activated later on. And this is what leads on to the phosphorylation of transcription factors. Overexpression of genes or increased gene amplification and mutated proteins of the ligand receptor adapter proteins or the effectors have been implicated in a number of different types of cancers. There is crosstalk between GPCR and EGFR uh, targets, and this is via the members of the RAS family of proteins, MAP1 and 2, which are targets of PKA, and also one of the CAMP targets, EPAC, can also stimulate RAP1. Here is a range of um, um, reference list for further reading. Next week, we will discuss um, a signaling pathway PI3K AKT mTOR and how it normally functions and what type of cancers it's found dysregulated and the causes of it. I hope you have benefited from this lecture. And, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email. Thank you.